So my name is Jenny Heyman and I am moderating um, this week's series of 101 Open Stories uh, as part of Year of Open. And we have great support from OE Consortium for doing that. We're also gathering blog-based stories, and so the video is just one method of that. We have a website called 101101openstories.org, and you can see some of the stories um, that are starting to grow there. And I think, Francis, we have a story from you, so <laughs> thank you very much for your contribution. Um, so I uh, work for eCampus Ontario, which is like BC campus, if you're familiar with that, only in Ontario, in Canada. I work for David Porter, who's well known in the open community. Um, I'm a program manager uh, and an instructional designer by trade. So um, David Wiley calls that the dark arts these days, which is fun. <laughs> so I practice the dark arts. And um, I'm very, very um, pleased and honored that you're joining us this morning and telling your stories. And the purpose of this series is to hear people's stories about how in the world they became open advocates, kind of their journey, education, professional life, personal life. How is it that you come to be working in open education uh, and in open research? Um, so let me start with Penny. Penny, if you can just introduce yourself and tell us where you are and what you're working on, and then we'll move into the stories just after that. Thanks, Jenny, and, and um, also thanks. It's a great privilege to be telling my story today, too. I've been, uh, I love Twitter, and I've been tweeting for a couple of years, and bits and pieces of my story have come out. But this is this is a great opportunity to get to know people a bit more and about where they're coming from. Anyway, I, I'm. Um, I have a background in, in secondary education in maths and science and at the moment I'm doing a PhD going solo by myself at home on um, looking into open education and teacher professional learning. So thanks Jenny. Wonderful. All right Kay and can you introduce yourself? Yeah hi my name is Kay and I'm in Brisbane Australia and um, I've got to thank Penny for introducing me in, uh, and inviting me to participate in this webinar. And um, I also come from an education teaching background, but primary. And I am also doing a PhD at the moment. Uh, and I do a lot of my work at home. Um, I'm looking at how teachers experience professional learning through their personal learning networks. So uh, as I, the further I go into the rabbit holes, the more I'm seeing massive crossovers with the open ed and seeing how it all just links together. So um, yeah, thank you so much for having me. Well, thanks for joining us. Hi, Nicola. We're just doing um, introductions alphabetically. So you're next, which is very timely. So <laughs> if you can just tell us where you are and introduce yourself, then we'll roll into storytelling. Uh, okay, great. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay checking okay so I'm Nicola Pallet I um, work in the Center for Innovation in Learning and Teaching at the University of Cape Town in South Africa I've actually prepared a little open story ahead of time you know and I've put some links in that document so I'm going to just share the Google Doc it's got commenting enabled I'm sharing it over there uh, just in case you know I might mention things and folks wonder you know what is that or where's the link Great. I'm going to give it to you ahead of time. Lovely. Cool. All right. Thank you. And Peter, uh, good, good afternoon or good morning. I still wish to know where you yeah. are. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Uh, well, first off, it's thanks to Chrissy for inviting me and telling me about this. <laughs> and uh, so that's really nice. I, um, I suppose in terms of my open that I'll talk about today, I've been working in um, a community open online courses site, which is about openness not being necessarily part of the academy. Although I personally am working at the academy because mm -hmm. I work at a, a, a college in Blackburn, Lancashire. So I'm in the UK, in the northwest, around about north of Manchester, if you know where that is. And um, so I, I teach in education studies and I think openness is something I'm encouraging my students and people out, more not students, so that's more of my main interest, is about what openness actually means, you know, and, and how it where there's open and stop, which I think is nowhere, but I think that's like um, it's a difficult thing to move from the concept of open between the academy and, and academics and, and knowledge as it is and openness and includes everybody and everywhere. So that's what I'll talk about. All right, lovely. 
<clears throat> All right, so we're going to go back around the circle. We're going to start with Penny with uh, storytelling. And I would say, you know, 10 minutes or so, Penny, and then we'll, uh, we'll just keep rolling through. Okay, could you give me the wind-up signal when we're getting close? <laughs> yes, yes, I can. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Um, I guess my story comes from um, two points of view. That is, that is how openness has affected me personally and then what I've been doing as a, as a professional, as a teacher. So um, I, I've got, I wrote a little bit down about my story here today. I um, started my career as a... As a um, a research scientist. So I worked in the a laboratory for a couple of years before I became a teacher and took on teaching. Um, and then uh, what I noticed um, as, a, as an early career teacher was that at the school I worked, there was um, the, the professional learning we got was pretty horrible. Um, you know, some of it was helpful, but it was um, not terribly effective in terms of helping me in changing my practice. But as far as the office that I shared with other teachers, there was a lot of collegiality within the office, a lot of sharing of, of uh, resources so that we didn't have to, you know, keep rewriting a maths test every year. There was a lot of support, a lot of emotional support. Um, and just, I think that, that a lot of my learning, what helped me move from an early career teacher to an experienced teacher over 20 years was the, was the informal um, culture of professional learning that I got um, in my immediate office of, of peers. Um, and so, so really, I uh, to, the, to begin with, it was about resources and sharing. And then in the early 90s, I, um, I, I was very excited by the internet. I'll never forget the day. You know, there are transformative moments in your life that you don't forget. Well, I never forget the day that I first connected to the internet. And, you know, those of you who are old enough to remember the, the, the dial tones that we got on our phones when, you know, when we were connecting up to the internet. And I saw this little globe spinning in the corner of my computer. And that, that was a really exciting moment for me because it meant that, that I could access information uh, from home. I didn't have to wait to go to the library. I didn't have to plan my lessons at, at work. I could, I could get whatever I needed from home. So it was, it was convenient and I had access uh, to, to information back in those days. And then, um, then I, after 20 odd years, I left the classroom and um, spent a couple of years finding out what I wanted to do. So I did quite a few um, online courses and by that stage the internet had become interactive. So I, I was very uh, excited by the fact that I could connect with people around the globe. I did a couple of courses and um, a couple of MOOCs and learned, learned heaps and did, taught a couple of informal courses and things like that. Then I began to realise that um, the kind of learning that I liked was pretty random. Because um, um, I used to get I used to get annoyed by the fact that if I was locked into a into a course that I that I couldn't take all of my work that I'd done. Um, you know, it just disappeared when the course ended. And that, so I guess I was beginning to develop that understanding of, of um, ownership of, of the work that I did so that I could keep it and then reuse it and then share it with others as well. Um, so I did, I did the, um, the old MOOC and the ET MOOC, a couple of connectivist MOOCs, and, and they're the MOOCs where I started to um, really get excited about what the open web uh, meant to me. And I, at this stage, I didn't, I didn't understand open education, I didn't understand what it was all about, but I knew that I, I could just go anywhere and do anything, and I met lots of people. Um, I suppose, what did I write down? I did, I did quite a bit of reflecting on this today. So I guess um, the, the, the real moment for me was when Twitter, once again, I've been listening to some of these talks, Jenny, that, that, that you've been facilitating over the last few days and just about everyone has said that Twitter has been transformative for them. You know, what they've started to, to, to understand open education through Twitter and I guess that, that happened to me when I think it was that Alec Kuros was 
heading towards Melbourne to do um, the person PLN conference, I think, in 2012, I think it was. Wow, that's great. <laughs> I think it was 12. And, and then he tweeted, um, why do networks matter to you? Heading to Melbourne, just doing some crowdsourcing, why do networks matter to you? And I responded in a blog post, why networks matter to me in terms of professional learning and, and um, not reinventing the wheel and all that kind of stuff. And, and then uh, a couple of days later, I was watching a live stream from the PLN, PLN conference in Melbourne and, and Alec finished that conference with, with um, a paragraph from my blog post. Nice. And I thought, I thought, oh my goodness, here am I, an insignificant you know, person, teacher, sitting at home just writing my bit. And I've connected with, it, with an educator on the other side of the globe and, and he's used my words to, to share the meaning of a professional learning network. And that really made me understand um, what this connectivity was was all about. So it was more not so much about not so much about sharing resources, but um, sharing ideas. Um, so after that, I I, th I think I was on Facebook one day, and and, and a, PA, a couple of PhD scholarships were advertised from um, the University of Southern Queensland. I thought, oh, this is exactly what I'm interested in. I might just put in an application there. And to cut a long story short, I, that's why I'm here today. So my um, PhD is, I'm, I'm interested, I'm, I'm writing up now. So I have, I have explored the, the experiences of teachers who use the open web to, to gain professional learning about STEM education, mm -hmm. science, technology, maths and engineering. So I'm, I'm interested in their experience from their point of view because the literature says and anecdotal evidence you hear all the time that professional learning is not effective despite the millions of dollars that that are spent on it the, the millions of hours that go into professional learning but it's still not satisfactory so i wanted to go out and find out why so i've chosen a group of teachers who are doing something different they're using the open web to gain um, professional knowledge, you know, to, to learn professionally about STEM education. I wanted to find out what it is about their different experiences that are meaningful and effective to them. What is it that, that, um, what is it that they're aware of? So I'm trying to connect their awareness to meaning. And um, I'm using the, the approach of phenomenography to do that. And Phenomenography has a, a long background in the area of, um, of teaching and learning, um, mostly in the higher education sector, all that, all that work done about conceptions of learning, approaches to learning, deep and surface learning, solo taxonomy. Um, it's quite a history of, of work from the perspective of teachers that has gone into the, the tradition of phenomenography. So I'm, May, hope, mainly trying to look at, well, are, do teachers hold different conceptions of learning when they're learning on the open web? So I've got some really interesting results and I'm just trying to write up a thesis, which <laughs> I'm finding really challenging. Um, and just quickly from a personal point of view, how the web has changed me um, is I've, I've always been a person, and this has come up before, I think, I think Jenny, you might have mentioned this in, earlier on. I, I, um, I, I've always been a person that's my head is full of ideas, but I, I never had the confidence to to, to speak up. Um, I call it introversion. I'm, I'm not shy, but I, uh, but I, um, you know, things stay in here. Whereas, whereas being on the web has given me the opportunity to to overcome those barriers that I put on myself. Um, it's brought out my confidence that I can get out and show what I can do. I talk to different people. I have a good network. Um, yeah, it's just made me more confident as, as an educator. And um, I think that's a really special thing about the web, um, being able to go to conferences and, and learn um, that way. I used to blog a lot, but I haven't blogged much lately. 
So I guess, so professionally it's changed me and, and personally it's changed me and it's, it's because of the open web, it's because of open education, because of openness that I, I'm doing a PhD now and hopefully making a small contribution to, um, to the movement by adding some empirical evidence of, of um, teachers' experiences of learning this way. I guess that sums it up, Jenny. Well, that's, you know, that's a really great package of things. <laughs> great. So, um, Penny, I'm, I'm going to maybe skip over questions and see how we do in terms of uh, our full hour. So thank you very much for your story. Oh, lost you. Lots of things. Yeah, that, have we maybe. lost Jenny? Yeah, Jenny's oh. frozen. Hmm. Oh, she's coming just, back. Just dropped out. Yeah. Okay. Mm, mm, I'm making a mm face. It says my internet connection is unstable. Which, you know, <laughs> not sure if the internet or me. <laughs> All right, cross your fingers that it goes that it goes well. <laughs> so thank you very much. I was saying, Penny, for a lovely story, and uh, we're going to move on next to Kay um, and hear your story. Thank you. Thank you so much. And. Listening to Penny speak, I was thinking just how many similarities that uh, there were. Uh, I also had done some reflection. I've written down a few notes and I was like, oh, that's what I was going to say. That's exactly what I was going to say. Um, I can still say it. Yeah, I'm going to have to. <laughs> yeah. I was going to um, share my story from the perspective of myself as a learner because although I have been an educator all of my adult life and even while I'm studying my PhD I'm still working as a sessional academic and teaching I'm teaching this semester inquiry learning for the Master of Education at QUT at Queensland University of Technology. Um, from the perspective of a learner is where I think that the open uh, environment, open access, open education has had its biggest influence on me and I think that when I, when I think back to when I was a little kid, I was a nerdy little kid. Um, I loved reading the encyclopedia. Mom and dad had this world book encyclopedia set that sat on the bookshelf and I'd already read all my books. We'd go to the library every week and I knew books, but I'd always fly through those. And so I turned to the encyclopedia and I used to read that. And I loved getting all this information, but there was a problem because it didn't take long before I'd read all the encyclopedia as well and there wasn't anywhere else to go. And mum wouldn't take me to the library more than once a week and you know, you could only borrow one book a week from the school library and I just couldn't access the amount of information that I wanted to because I just wanted to keep reading and keep learning. And so it wasn't surprising, I guess, that um, I went into primary school teaching and started teaching firstly year one and early years. And um, it was around the time that I started teaching that uh, Web 2.0, all of those sorts of things started to come out. And I was really excited because I had finally a stable internet connection and I had finally an encyclopedia that would never run out. I had, you know, the, the access to the information and then even more exciting. I mean, I used to spend hours on the stumble upon app, just randomly stumbling from website to website to website till it had gotten to this ridiculous amount of websites that I'd been to. And then I discovered that I could actually contribute as well as, as, you know, suck it all down. So I could start, I started blogging. Um, I've had lots of different blogs over the years. I wish I kept them all. I wish I'd maintained it all in one blog because I'd love to look back at my thinking from way back then, but um, you know, I, I haven't done that. But um, from being a primary school teacher, I um, became an, an assistant principal and then moved into teacher librarianship, which was where I felt my real calling was because that was where the information was. That was where the the, I could be around all of the information all the time, not just books, but accessing the internet, information literacy, all of those different things. And um, after, oh, I don't know how many years, 15 years, I moved into a position as the librarian for Brisbane Catholic Education. So I was the librarian that administered the central library and supported the staff of 
130 schools, it was about 10,000 staff, um, and uh, also provided a digital library for uh, the students. And that becoming the librarian was really the catalyst for me, I think, where I really started to understand the possibilities of sharing and accessing open information because there were two things that happened. First thing was part of my role was to become the copyright advisor for the whole of the archdiocese. And uh, that was new to me. I wasn't really familiar with all of that. I did a lot of reading, a lot of research, and I discovered Creative Commons. And so discovering those licenses and discovering that we had a way because the, uh, the system was producing a lot of resources um, and because we had the internet to provide access to them, they were sharing them publicly, but it was like, you, you can't just use any images you find on Google images. You know, this is, you just can't do that. You know, here's this other way, creative commons, you know, and public domain images, there's this growing amount of stuff that we can use and remix and share. And if we label our stuff in that same way, others can remix it. And it was this whole world that opened up. And one of the high points for me in that respect was um, one morning I had this particularly curly question come in from a school and I wasn't sure of the answer. And I thought, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna tweet Larry Lessig. And he, you know, he's the head of, you know, the, the father of creative I thought, you know, I'm going to do it. I'm not a very outgoing person, like in terms of um, meeting people face to face. If you meet me at a, like a cocktail party networking sort of event, I'm the <laughs> one standing behind other people trying to hide. But when it comes to online, I feel like Penny was saying, I feel free. I feel confident. And I thought, you know, what, what's the worst that can happen? He can just ignore it. So I tweeted this question to Larry Lessig and I don't know whether it was just because he happened to be brushing his teeth at the time and watching his phone or, but he tweeted back like 10 minutes later, he tweeted back with the answer and I was running around the office. You know, oh my gosh, Larry. Larry. And everyone's just like, who? And I'm like, <laughs> no, you don't understand. This is incredible. And that really opened my eyes to the fact, like Penny was saying, that little old me in Brisbane, Australia, could speak with someone like Larry Lessig and, and find out answers directly from, from him. The second catalyst was that I um, began blogging in earnest in that I wasn't just blogging my own personal uh, thoughts and reflections. I started a blog for the library and using that as a way of sharing our resources publicly because we had an intranet we had that way of, and that was the way they wanted us all to share our stuff. But there were so many more people that we were supporting than just the students and the, well, not even the students and just the teachers who could access that internet. There were the students. There were student teachers. There were people at the local universities. There were parents. There was the general public. There was so many different people that I wanted to share with that I couldn't do via the intranet, that I put it all on this blog and started sharing it that way. Cause there was only one librarian, me and all of these people. And so I decided that this was the best way to do it. And so the co combination of the Creative Commons licenses and the sharing on the blog were, you know, my, my entree into this whole new world of open access and open and sharing and, and, the, and the learning that can, that can come up from it. So a couple of years have passed and I kept pursuing my interests and developing my Twitter network uh, and the opportunity came for me to uh, study a PhD which I'd always wanted to do but never thought I'd ever have the chance to do and the, the, the opportunity arise, arose and so I started my journey at the beginning of last year looking at personal learning networks for teachers because like Penny was saying I I personally have learnt so much from other people from my networks I mean Lawrence, Lawrence Lessig is Larry Lessig is just, you know, one example. I have learned from so many people and they've all been so generous. And I thought, I want to find out if there are ways that I can find empirical evidence where I can develop a model that will justify this as a, a, real, a real way of professional learning that systems and organisations and registration bodies and things like that will recognise because it is a real, really powerful way of learning. And so while I was studying that, I came across the Open Network Learning Course, which is, uh, it's, it's not a MOOC, 
it's an online open access course, but it's based on uh, problem based learning and you go into little small groups and you work in a group and you solve different uh, problems to do with scenarios to do with open network learning and uh, open pedagogy and teaching at a tertiary level. Um, and this is run by uh, three universities out of Sweden and a couple out of South Africa. Uh, and but because that it, it's online and it's open, it's all hosted on a free WordPress site. You know, people from all over the world can participate. And so I joined in as a learner. Um, I said to them, look, you know, I'm in Australia and my time zone is completely different from the rest of you. So I won't join a group because I'm just going to be a disadvantage because I'm going to be saying, hey, you know, I don't want to meet every, you know, two times every week at 2 a.m. Um, but they were very kind and very open and flexible as, you know, I've come to see in the open community, everyone is so encouraging and um, said, no, no, we can make a group. We can do this. We can make it work. You know, it might be 6 a.m. for you um, and 3 p.m. for everyone else or, you know, it might be, but there'll be a sweet spot somewhere that we can meet. And so I've been involved in three iterations of that now and this semester will be the fourth iteration after being a student participant in the first iteration, I have been a uh, group facilitator for two. And then this third one, I'm actually hosting a webinar with um, another educator on open education. Um, and there's people in my group from, there's been people from Sweden, Poland, France, Pakistan, Singapore, you know, other Australians, we find this sweet spot and we're able to meet in small groups and do this problem-based learning. Uh, each week we meet, we create a, a, um, a web-based artifact that we then share to the larger cohort. There are webinars that we participate in. There are conversations, there are tweet chats. We had a tweet chat with Alec Kuros. He's one of my heroes. I just <laughs> um, and all of this has, it's given me, confidence as Penny was saying, but it's also just really allowed me to do more than I ever thought I ever could. I, or I have this image of myself as little old Kay in Brisbane, Australia, but now I'm interacting on a global, you know, stage and it's amazing. There's still a few drawbacks because, you know, we do still have time zones. We can't really move the sun. I wish we could um, so you stop the world from spinning a little bit so that our time zones aligned somehow. Um, it is a long way away from other places, you know, like there's a conference, the network learning conference. Oh my gosh. I so want to go to it next year. It's in Croatia. Oh, it would be my dream come true. But you know how far Brisbane, Australia is from Croatia? <laughs> it will cost a fortune to get there. And you know, it'll be a huge thing. I, I'm determined. I really want to do it. I, but it's, it'll be like a once in a lifetime thing. Whereas if you're based in Europe, this might be something that you, you know, might consider as part of your learning. You know, this is something you, you just, you just do, you know? Uh, so there are, you know, still things that we have to get over, but wow, how far have we come and how honored am I that, you know, the, we, that I'm, I'm able to be part of this and, and I'm hoping that through my research that I can help more people step into this world. Cause I know, still a lot of people out there who aren't part of it and if that's their choice totally fine not going to drag you in by brute force but if you want to be part of it you know I want to be able to be someone who can help you do that so I don't know how long I've talked for then it seemed like I was talking a million miles an hour <laughs> that is absolutely perfect okay couldn't, oh yeah I find it better uh, I love Thank your Larry you. Lessig story. So I, my short Larry Lessig story is that I, I have a Larry Lessig for president mug. So while he was <gasps> the very brief moment that he was running for president, I snagged up all the goods. So oh, fantastic. And, and commune over coffee because I have his mug. <laughs> That's so awesome. All right. Thank you so much, Kay. That was an amazing, a really great and amazing story um, as well. Um, Thank so you. We're going to move on to uh, Nicola, I think, alphabetically. Sorry, Peter, you have to go last. <laughs> Hi there. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah. 
Okay, great. So something I forgot to mention is I'm also part of the Emerge Africa team and I want to say thank you to some of my colleagues who have also just joined us, uh, Jakob, Kath and Tony. Um, yeah, so I shared a link to a little Google Doc a while ago um, with my um, sort of my open story and I think it's very much I guess how, how you feel right now uh, is is about openness and where things started one has to go back to artifacts and get a sense of your practices your thoughts how those shifted um, I think openness is nothing without networks and I mean I see that all the time even when we are designing events for Emerge Africa so Emerge Africa is a professional development network for educational technology practitioners and researchers in Africa and we collaborate with presenters on uh, Google Docs and then you only see the um, okay cool and you know what you when you sign up for an event on the website that is actually an event that's been collaborated on elsewhere. So open practices is very much part of how we do things. <laughs> um, but going back to, back to this idea of, of artifacts, so I started my open journey or what I see as an open journey, actually firstly as a researcher when I published from my master's thesis, that was back in you know 2009 and that was one of my early sort of meetings with Emerge Africa because back then they were an online conference so exactly what you've been talking about how it's really expensive to travel and to attend international conferences um, my colleague Tony Carr really recognized that and designed this online conference for educational technology uh, researchers practitioners in, in on the continent and so, so so from that I did a presentation and a paper which was then accepted for an open access uh, journal so I mean I didn't know much about open access publishing uh, I also had never heard terms like um, you know open scholarship but I think back then it wasn't really that popular I mean, we're talking 2000, between 2009, 2012, yeah, 20, yeah, 2012. Um, I was also, I uh, later tutored, I was tutoring on a course on social media for second year media studies students. And I designed uh, an assessment where students created their own videos. And from there, I worked with a colleague who, um, I wasn't working, I was then situated in media studies, so I wasn't in the role I am in now. Um, but it was sort of my first uh, sort of, I'm going to say, contact with the unit I'm working now is when I worked on that U uh, OER. And that was in, I think it was 2012 or 2013. And, you know, we put it into the repository and I think it takes a while for OERs to become usable and for them to have an impact. So I read it, or it was, I can't remember where, but it was something about how OERs go to repositories to die. <laughs> I'm not sure if you, if you heard of that or know where it comes from, yeah, please let me know in the chat. And yeah, it was, it was interesting because, um, it's taken a while for there to be, you know, interaction with that OER. So I had a lecturer, and most notably last year at UCT, she was in environmental sciences. She was setting up a video project uh, with her students. And she, you know, asked me for advice and, and that kind of thing. And then presented back, she offered a um, seminar on how she used videos with her students. So for me, that was very, very rewarding um, because it wasn't just sharing my practice, but enabling someone else to share their practice with a broader community. Um, yeah, so that, that was awesome. And after that, I had a colleague who works at an NGO, like ask me, say, look, you know, hey, I found this resource on uh, student video projects and I'd love to use it for a workshop but you know you've got non-commercial on here 
And I realized, well, actually, you know, why did we put that there? Do I actually care if people make money from it? Well, not really. You know, I said, well, you know, here's permission granted by email. But it really got me thinking about licenses and formats. So if you had a look at that resource um, or maybe have a look at it later, it's a pretty decent looking PDF, but it's a PDF. So that's a super... Actually, when I, I was at the AECT convention last year, which is the Association for Communications and Technology, Educational Technology, I think, Education and Technology, uh, there's a link to that as well. But I sat down at a breakfast event with David Wiley. <laughs> and David Wiley was talking about uh, licenses and how sometimes, and different formats. So how a non-commercial license can actually be um, very restrictive and, and actually quite closed. So that, that was a very interesting reflection for me. I also re uh, thought again about our format. So yes, this PDF is great, you know, designed it in InDesign, it's interactive, granted you're using it in Google Chrome and you can have a look at, you know, the videos display inside of it. But I'm in Africa. Okay, people in my country don't have good bandwidth. Was this a very good idea? Probably not. Um, so, that has really shifted um, my practice. It's one of the OERs I actually want to go back and redo. Um, so I think in all, we've got to think not just about users and OERs that look attractive and exciting and showcase our abilities, but we've got to think about the people who are going to be using them. That was a very um, sort of important moment for me. And this sort of fed into the course I co-convened with my colleague, Tony, uh, facilitating online. And he was involved with the initial design of the course and they designed a lovely course leader's guide, which is all about how do you facilitate a course, uh, which is to build capacity in online facilitation. Okay, so it's got all the materials um, that people need to run the course themselves. Okay, so, and then I thought about it, I was like, well, actually, it's kind of like you have a textbook for students and you have a, te a, a, a textbook, like a help guide for teachers, but you're only giving the teacher version, right? So what we're working on at the moment, it's in progress, is because people actually need a sense of what does this course look and feel like? So they want to see it inside the OE, inside an LMS. Okay, my video is gone. But yes, I'm hoping sorry, I didn't want to interrupt you, Nicola. For some reason, it's uh, we can see okay, your but my time is probably up. We have a couple more minutes if there's more you want to okay, tell. Okay, great, <laughs> <laughs> wonderful. Yeah, I just wanted to say that um, it got me thinking about um, contextual information and learning design that's often absent from many OERs that you find find out there. Okay, so this course, you know, here are all the materials. Go for it, teach it, but um, know that this design works well with 30 to 40 people. Um, you know, it, there are activities that take, um, you know, people need, I think, it allows for a di diverse level of digital literacies, but maybe a bit too easy for some in the initial stages. So kind of, you know, sharing that. Um, the other thing that I really have been thinking deeply about is that we need a form of critical openness and that we think about openness in relation to um, you know we think about in relation to our own context and what that means and how do you enable open um, practices uh, the uptake of OERs OER adaptation uh, in your country what are, what are some of the some of the barriers so obviously for us, one of the things is format. So this webinar like we're having right now, it is, you know, we're using video. Um, video is very high bandwidth. So what we do with our Emerge Africa um, webinars, so I shared a link on YouTube, you can go watch some of our past events and you're welcome to join us, um, to join our network while we may be situated in Africa and, you know, focus on the continent are our primary audience. We're very open to anyone joining us, but we just use audio and slides because it's the least bandwidth intensive. 
So, I mean, even here we're sharing practice, but it's quite a, like a Northern perspective on, on sharing practice because of the bandwidth involved. Um, so those are the kinds of things that I think when we're thinking about a critical openness, it's about the design choices uh, that are involved in that open practice. Yeah. But I really, I knew this was going to, I, what I wanted to say was going to be more than 10 minutes. So I prepared a Google Doc ahead of time with links. So feel free to, it's commentable, uh, by the way. So if anyone wants to stay in touch, you feel free to do so. Cool. All right, lovely. Thank you so much, Nic Nicola. I'm going to, just to let everyone know, um, once I finish these four days of, of video, I'm going to, on the 101openstories.org website, um, organize the videos and any associated links. So I'm saving the chat, which is great for me, um, and making sure that ever, that uh, at least your your Twitter information is there, so that others can contact you, which is uh, which is really lovely. One of the things that you talked about, Nicola, that really resonates with me, uh, and has emerged as a new conversation um, with press books. So uh, here in Canada, we're working with Hugh McGuire and uh, his colleague Zoe for, uh, on press books projects. Um, but one of the things, as you say, OER goes somewhere to die sometimes. Um, uh, one of the things that we're now talking about is how to add facilitation guides to OER. Um, so how to, to ensure that somebody knows um, how we have used this resource. They're under no obligation to use it that way. But if sometimes resources are designed for a very particular size of audience, uh, or for in a very particular format for good reasons. Um, putting accompanying guides with them uh, can actually help the next user um, to at least know where to start or at least have some background in how the resource was initially used. So I really like that you mentioned that and I, you know, I think that's a great aspect that we can include in, in our work um, making OERs and sharing them is you know, how to, a little bit of a how-to guide. It doesn't have to be elaborate, uh, but it might be of help. So great. Thank you very much, Nicola, for sharing your story. And we're going to move over to Peter now. Yeah, you can't hear me okay. Can you hear me okay now? <laughs> okay. Yeah, the music doesn't help. Yeah, very good. Uh, Peter. Um, I don't know where to start on mine. Some people have gone quite far back and some not so. I think um, the thing, I think, I'm not sure how much part of an open community I'm in one respect, but I've got a real interest in it. And I, I'm not sure. One of my quotes that I've got from a participant, I'm doing a, a thesis on mine. I'm writing a PhD thesis on the Coops. And somebody said to me, well, it was a couple of years ago, but I've just been writing it up recently. And they said that we need to stop being students and we need to stop being teachers and we just need to be people, people that learn. And it kind of summed up a lot of the stuff that I've been interested in for a long time. I went to university when I was 18 and I was the first person that went. And I, and I had an okay time. But um, I went to university in London and London was a lot more educational than university. And I, I think that in life, I've realised that we, we cut off so much and what openness promises and that I really like some of the stories about the internet and you know Penny's about it giving confidence. I really appreciate that as well and the connections that you make and Kay's stories as well, the Lawrence Lessig thing. Actually I've got a split between that. I once emailed, I did phenomenography for a paper and I, and I, sent, I sent a question to Ferenc Martin and I thought he must be dead and he replied to me. I actually sent him the paper after that. I didn't reply to that. <laughs> so he's, he's off my Christmas card list now. But I think that one of the things that um, I've been interested in about Open, my first educational stuff, I was in Greece and I was teaching the children of people who worked in hotels. And when I came back to the UK, I come from a town in uh, the north of England called Wigan. It's got a famous rugby league team, so I mean, it might have some resonance in Brisbane, but nowhere else. But um, it, it's a working class town, and I realised that my experience of school was really negative, and it wasn't on my own. But that didn't mean that people who didn't go on to university were particularly were bright or weren't learning lots and weren't doing lots of things. The, the opposite was true; they were living very rich lives, and. 
as I came back from Greece, I started teaching over here as a TEFL teacher and uh, as an English uh, literacy teacher. And I realised that the system, the curriculum, the colleges, the things that were set out to help people were actually just trying to batter people into submission more, more often than trying to help them. It, was, it wasn't about teaching people how to live better lives. It was teaching them how to become more economically viable units with level twos rather than just doing what they wanted to do. And there was very little, even in terms of openness in universities as I, and widening outreach, I was really interested in what if open could be two-way, rather than it being the universities always facing out, what if it actually let people in? And I don't mean people coming into the universities and becoming students, not having to become something else to enter, but the knowledge that they brought in was there. And, and as a literacy teacher, and I did this not, really for a qualification, I just started reading a lot of Paolo Freire and popular education. And he's one guy that I read and I thought, well, this is just brilliant. And the reason it was brilliant was he just got rid of theory. It wasn't, he, he just get called a theorist a lot. I don't think he's a theorist. I thought he's just somebody who's talking about respecting people. And I think openness is a brilliant way of being able to have mutual respect. and. Um, I'm aware of the issues of distance that people have talked about. So what, what I did was when I created the course, the kooks thing, I worked with people, who, a lot of them were in uh, universities, some of them were colleagues. And what in, was interesting was that people who were my colleagues in university were using it to do things that they couldn't do in university. So they started to use it. It's a Moodle platform. I've got a whole history of that of how much time it took us to get the technology right. And we ended up using Moodle because of a community volunteer who found it and gave it to us. But people started using it in different ways. But the more interesting thing was that I have people who created, one example I'll give is, there's a, um, some friends, who they are friends now, they were just acquaintances that met online, from Leeds, which is about 70 miles from here, but it's a different county, so it's a different world, Leeds. But they, um, they, they work with people with schizophrenia and, and they weren't, they were, fa they have family members who were schizophrenic. And what they wanted was a place where they weren't immediately medicalised and it became a medical problem or they were immediately problematised because it was something to do with social services. They wanted somewhere to talk about what actually schizophrenia was, what it actually like, what happened in the day, because it wasn't a problem for a lot of people. It was just a different way of being. So the place that we created, they, they came together, they created a group, I think we acted partly as their catalyst. And openness was the openness to question what knowledge was and where it came from. And it wasn't that it came from universities or it came from academies or it came from establishments or institutions, it came from people. And I think that was the openness that I've been really in, involved with. And, and I went to uh, one of the OER events in Newcastle. I was trying to remember what year it was. It was either 2012 or 2014. It was a great event. And I, but I, I remember thinking then that, you know, when people talk about openness from the institutions, it just sounds institutional. And when people talk about openness from the, cons the perspective of people, it feels like a very different thing. It feels like an exciting thing. It feels new. It feels open. It feels like the excitement of the spinning globe back in the late 90s, early 2000s, somebody mentioned, and then the idea of being networked. And so that concept of open for me and what I'm interested in and what I think is really there is, is a breaking down of the walls between the academy, perhaps more than we're comfortable with. I've got my own experiences of MOOCs and one of the things that we created this for was on MOOCs, I realised that although MOOCs seem ace, and there's a lot of knowledge going out, you've either got the really big corporate MOOCs, the Coursera and the edXs and things that are expertise being given away, it seems like there's always a catch and there's definitely a catch with all. Or, or on C MOOCs, I invited people onto a few C MOOCs that I've been involved and they were terrified because if you don't have a background to have that discussion, if you don't have the confidence, it can be quite terrifying spaces that 
you know, they are quite detailed. They do use academic language and they do use academic ways of getting into a conversation and, and how we talk about generating knowledge afterwards. And so once we've started creating courses where people are using, people from homeless shelters, I've got a couple of examples I mentioned in a minute, the schizophrenia group, lots and lots and lots of small courses. We've got people doing Urdu courses for the community and little things like this. With, course, with student numbers less than 10 in the main, less than 10. And it's because knowledge then is fluid and it's, and it's really, um, it's emergent and then it disappears. And you can't put any of the measures that we're used to on it. You can't put measures of how many times did you come. You know, the new problem of drop-off. Who cares about drop-off? If you go in and you use it and you've got the information you want, you never visit again. That's your choice. Why do we always have to impose this? This thing of, oh, no, you know, the retention, the achievement, the success, the accreditation. Forget all that. If the learning's apparent and if it's worthwhile, people come together and use it and do it. It's, it's what it needs to be. That's what open can be. That's what I think it is for me. I think another thing is, I, 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 there's lots of examples of, you know, it's, it's, it's in famous people. I wonder how they feel. I was, I had an interview with Howard Rangel once and he, and he talked about networks and he was such a, a fabulous guy. But the best thing about that was, after being like a fanboy, which I was, but after that moment, Lots of other people that you didn't possibly, you, you couldn't have known, but who watch and listen to what he says, they contact you and your network broadens in a different way. And some of those networks become communities. And some of those communities, and this is the beauty of it, I've just noticed down the bottom is a great, great friend of mine now, Alex Dunedin's joining. Because one of the things that I've realised about openness as well, where distance is a problem, and the conferences, and I really hope KU you get to go to Croatia for that. I think you should do a crowdfunding. I think we'll all throw a pound in each. But I, I think that we, we don't want to create. There's a guy I uh, read, in he's from Cape Town. There's so many links to things. A guy called Chetty, and he talks about how universities were creating a network that spanned the globe. But it, they were all... They were like spaceships that dropped into communities and they didn't engage with the communities, they just made links to the next spaceship. Do you know, so the, the, the universities in cities were making links with the universities in the next cities and forgetting the cities that they were from. Alex is involved with something called the Ragged University or runs the Ragged University, where the, a lot of the things that we've done on Kooks and the idea of Open is it's online. But online, excludes as many as people as it includes and so there's an additional thing to this where you could have free and, and, and they do run right Alex has been running these for years we've started just last year with a few but free public lectures we have them in pubs Alex and I have them in cafes and restaurants and pubs as well and, and community centers so the idea that people can be open they can use the network of the, the web can allow openness that allows different people to come in, but then those communities can generate learning in their spaces. And like the Paolo Freire thing, I suppose what's the killer for this, the, the most crucial element of what uh, I think comes from popular education for me is that knowledge that's generated outside expertise, or outside academy and accredited expertise, is no less valuable than that which is from there. In fact, it's superior for most people because that university knowledge is it's nice to know and it's great if you're invited and involved and, and, and funded for it. But actually, most of the knowledge you need in your life comes from somewhere else. So it's about having that openness that these networks can create, be created, they can inform, and then we've got spaces where everybody's knowledge is being not accredited, but well, yeah, accredited, but not with a certificate. Accredited with mutual respect and an understanding that we're all worth sharing. So I'll go back to that comment. We stop being students, stop being teachers, and just be people that want to learn. And I think, I'll, I'll finish my, I think openness for me is, um, it's summed up with something that I've been trying to get in this thesis, and that's been so difficult. The difficulty of having, man's been participant action research, it could only be that. But what's been really difficult, and, and it's really, it's really fixed it in me as a lived thing, is that 
actually trying to write a report of things that are multiple million, well, not millions, but lots of people's lives. It's just, it's ridiculous. It's a continual compromise and it's not the best way to do it. But it's the only way I'll get the thesis and I've been doing it that long now. It's cost me a fortune, so I am going to get it. But I do realise that that's not really what this project was about. And this thing, I suppose, the, the statement that I'm trying to sum it up is that openness allows participation, not expertise. And I think if we take part, if we are involved in learning and teaching, rather than continually searching for standards and standardising things and saying, oh, the quality control has to be this, that or the other, just take part. And then, you know, your standards and your community standards, they will emerge between you and the people who need it. We don't need somebody up there, out there, somewhere else, telling any other group what their standards should be. So I think, that, is that my time? Penny, it's, it's, I, yeah, it's very close. <laughs> right, well, that, that's We're close to the top of the hour. Participation, not expertise, and I'll end there. <laughs> Lovely. Um, I have to say, um, as always, I'm astonished at the stories that I hear from this community and, and the work that's going on uh, that I have no idea. I, you know, I live in my little bubble, as, as many of us do. <laughs> and it's such, a, um, it's such a great honor to actually be able to hear these stories. Um, Peter, I haven't met you and I don't know you very well, but because you know someone in my network, uh, now I do. And um, you know what you're talking about resonates with me deeply. I'm working on my ed D for a reason. It's you know it's career wise and empowerment wise. It's going to do something for me. That is that exactly what you're talking about. Um, everything has changed. Knowledge is co-creation um, because of the open community for me and because of the internet and all these things. Um, so I want to thank you all for your time and your stories today. I'm so glad that we are, have been recording and that we've captured these and that we can share them with other people in the community. Uh, and I encourage you to, um, to invite people in your communities to share their stories with us on 101openstories.org. What we're trying to do is celebrate the year of open and hear these kinds of stories from everyone in the community. Um, and I will post all of the links as well. So I'm going to make sure I save the chat, which I can do, which is lovely, with the stories so that um, anyone who's listening um, can check in with the people who've told their stories today. So again, thank you all very much. Have a wonderful day. And I look forward to seeing you all over the world in all kinds of places. <laughs>